Well, we are in our message series on the life of Jesus, the time Jesus spent on the earth as a man performing miracles, but most importantly, teaching who he is and, and what life is all about. And the life of Jesus is documented in four books in the Bible that are known as the Gospels. And today we're going to be in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John. Last week we joined the Last Supper, that meal that Jesus shared with his 12 disciples on the night he would be arrested, the day before he would be crucified on the cross. And while the disciples were arguing about which one of them was the greatest, Jesus gave them a radical lesson in what greatness means in the kingdom of God by washing their feet as a means of explaining that from God's perspective, to be truly great is to view yourself as a servant. This week we continue at the Last Supper and we're going to see the hearts of three of the disciples contrasted. And as is always the case with the Word of God, it's going to reveal some things about us in the process. It's been well said that you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. And I think this is going to be one of those studies. So let's jump in. We're going to be in John chapter 13 verse 21. It says this, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit, underlined troubled in spirit, and testified, that just means he spoke, and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. That'll change the mood in a hurry, right? One of you here, we're having this great meal. We finally got everybody seated. The arguing has stopped. Jesus has given us this profound lesson. Hey guys, just a quick announcement. Uh, one of you is going to betray me. Continue with your meal. And I want to make sure we have the right understanding here because Jesus is not troubled for himself. He's not troubled because of the betrayal that he's going to suffer. He's troubled for Judas, the one who's going to betray him. Because Jesus loved Judas. He's grieved by the decision that he knows Judas has already made because it's the decision that's going to lead to Judas' eternal damnation, Judas being separated from Jesus forever. In 2 Peter 3.9, we're told that God is not willing that any should perish. In other words, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He doesn't want anybody to be lost, even Judas. He doesn't want anyone to reject him. But yet God gives everyone the choice. Later that night when Judas will come to Jesus in the garden and identify Jesus to those who would seek to kill him, what does Jesus say to Judas? Jesus will say incredibly, friend, why have you come? King James, friend, what seekest thou? Friend. It's an incredible thing that even in the moment when Judas is betraying Jesus and he's brought the soldiers, he's brought the religious leaders there to arrest Jesus, Jesus is still calling him friend. Verse 22, then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. This would have been quite a moment. Hey, there's going to be a betrayal from within. One of you who's been with me these past three years on a near daily basis is gonna hand me over to those who desire to see me killed. Now as a reminder, the reason they're perplexed is because Judas was not an obvious villain. Judas couldn't be distinguished because he wore like a floor length black coat, was constantly tapping his fingers together and chuckling sinisterly under his breath all the time. It was nothing like that. Nobody thought it would be Judas. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, it tells us at this moment, they were each wondering if Jesus was talking about them. And Matthew will tell us that when Judas tries to play along and, and also asks, oh, Rabbi, is it I? Jesus says to him, just discreetly to Judas, he says, you've said it, you've said it. And when most of us think of the Last Supper and what it would have looked like, I would bet that for most of us it's the Da Vinci painting that comes into our mind. Jesus at the center, this big long table, and everybody for some reason facing the same direction, not actually facing each other. I'm like, they didn't have Facebook then. Nobody would have sat like that, so they had no need to record it. So they would have sat facing each other. In reality, the setting was very, very 
different. It was a Roman style of dining around a table structure that was called a triclinium. And the best way to imagine it is if you imagine like the six foot tables we'd use for a potluck, six, uh, those six foot rectangular tables. If you imagine three of those arranged in a U. And for our purposes, imagine it as an upside down U. That's what the setting would be like. The tables would be low, would be about one foot to one and a half feet off the ground. And then everyone would sit around the outside edge of the U on their stomachs with their feet facing away from the table so that those serving the meal could work on the inside of the U and clear plates and bring more food and things like that. So everyone would be on their stomachs around the outside, feet facing away from the table, and then they would lean on their elbows and lean specifically on their left elbow to eat. And they would reach over, and most meals, including this one, would be a piece of bread that you would dip in a stew that would have meat in it. So they'd lean on their left elbow and dip their bread into some type of stew pot. So if you imagine this upside down U, the host of the meal would be sitting near the bottom of the U on this corner, second from the end. So he would be sitting right there. The guest of honor would be seated to his left, and the trusted friend would be seated to his right, right on the edge of this corner of the U over here. And then as you made your way around the U, it would be in order of descending importance. Kind of an awkward thing for a dinner party, right? You know, you show up and immediately understand what the host of the meal thinks of you. So in in descending importance like this, and uh, right on the end, on this side of the U, would be the servant. And the table would be set up so that this corner of the U was closest to the door so that the servant could get up easily and quickly and go to the kitchen, get more Cheetos or whatever was needed in that case. So knowing all of that is going to add a whole other dimension of understanding to what's about to unfold at this meal. Verse 23, it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, that means his chest, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. You're going to find in the Gospel of John, John uh, is very fond of referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I guess he's like, it's my gospel. I'm going to add a couple of touches that I like. So that's what he did. Calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. Now, so if you're in that culture and you wanted to chat uh, one-on-one with the person on your left, you wouldn't just sort of lean over because they would be leaning on their elbow. What you would do is you just sort of do a little bit of a roll and then you could sort of lean against their shoulder and chest. It wasn't anything weird, anything sexual or anything like that. You just lean like that and you talk to them like this and you could have a one-on-one conversation that the rest of the people wouldn't be able to hear. However, you could only do this with the person on your left if you sort of visualize this because the person on your right is gonna essentially have their back to you. So it wouldn't work. So here's what this means. If John is leaning on Jesus' chest and he's leaning like that, it means that John is seated to the right of Jesus because John is able to lean left and be on Jesus. So John is seated on the right of Jesus, which means he's in the position of the trusted friend. You can go ahead and make a note of that. John was seated on the right of Jesus in the position of the trusted friend. And John wants to make sure we know that. He's the disciple whom Jesus loves. He's in the position of trusted friend. Verse 24, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him, the actual word there is beckoned to him, to ask who it was of whom he spoke. So why does Peter ask John to ask who it is? So you've got to to get the picture here. Peter's like, John, John, ask him who it is. Why does Peter want to know? Because if you read the rest of the Gospels, Peter is a hothead. And Peter, we will find out in the garden, Peter's packing. He is carrying a little mini sword called a machaira that would be about this long. And he has it with him all the time, just ready to throw down in case the Jews decide to revolt against the Romans. He's ready to go and do his part. And we'll find out in the garden later on when they come to arrest Jesus, he's really prepared to use that thing. He doesn't really know how. He's not very good with it, but he's ready to go. So Peter's like telling John, ask Jesus who it is so I can kill them. That's what's actually going on here. Now scholars tell us, but because the idea is that Peter beckons to John, Peter is most likely seated directly across from John in the position of servant. 
in the lowest position at the table. So make a note of this. Peter was most likely seated lowest in the position of servant. So, so Jesus places John, the youngest disciple, in the place of the trusted friend, while placing Peter, the oldest disciple, the one considered the chief disciple, in the position of servant. And this is interesting because this whole seating arrangement is most likely the cause of the argument the disciples had before Jesus washed their feet about who was the greatest. We don't know exactly how it goes down, but it's very possible they walk in the room and these seating arrangements are revealed and Jesus has arranged them this way. Or they're just fighting. It's a free-for-all to get position. If you've ever had kids and there's like one seat in your house that's better than others, we got like six kids and we don't have that big of a table. So a couple of the seats mean you've got to have like a leg on one side of a table leg. You're straddling a table leg. Those are the seats nobody in our house wants. So the kids are jockeying for position. This was like each seat was a commentary on how important you were, who was the greatest. So they get there and they have this big argument about who is the greatest. You sit there, no, I'm not sitting there. Well, Peter, Jesus has put you in the place of the servant, so uh, maybe you should wash our feet. And Peter's like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, how many of you walked on water? Nobody? That's right, because I'm the greatest. I'm not washing your feet. And they have this huge argument, all related most likely to where they're supposed to be seated. Now this arrangement was not an insult to Peter, it was a lesson because what had Jesus said earlier in his ministry? He had said, if anyone desires to be first, so in other words, if you want to be great, if you want to be the greatest, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That's what Jesus had told his disciples. He had said, if your ambition is to be a leader, to be in charge, then you've got to be the best at being a servant. That's what you've got to do. And Peter would go on to become the chief apostle. He would go on to lead the Jerusalem church. So Jesus was just getting him started on his training because in the kingdom of Jesus, those who lead have to do so from the position of servant. Verse 25, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he, that's John, said to him, Lord, who is it? So Peter motions across the table and says, ask Jesus who he's talking about. John rolls over toward Jesus and, and says to Jesus, I think discreetly, Lord, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, verse 26, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Now in Matthew's gospel, the language is a little different and it reads more like Jesus saying, it's the one who's been dipping bread with me. In other words, it's the one that I've been sharing a bowl with throughout this meal. Now in order for that to be true, it would have to be someone who was sitting next to Jesus. They wouldn't just have one bowl and get up and walk across and dip it all the time. They would have multiple bowls so that two or three people would each share a bowl. So if this is someone that Jesus has been sharing with, where Jesus is positioned on the table, he probably would have been sharing a bowl with John and then one other person next to him. So the other person he's sharing a bowl with is seated on his left, which is very very interesting, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now, when you read the different accounts of this event in the Gospels, it doesn't seem to make sense that Jesus tells all the disciples it's Judas, that he tells them it's the person I give this bread to, and he gives it to Judas, and nobody does anything. That doesn't seem to make sense. Peter has already told John, ask him who it is, because Peter wants to do something about it. What makes sense, and what is my personal belief, is that while Jesus tells the whole group that one of them will betray him, I think he only tells John that it's going to be Judas specifically. Now, you can read the other accounts. I put the references on your outline near the top there. You can go home and read them this week and come to your own conclusion. But when you read them all, I think that's what makes the most sense. Then it says, and having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So in order for Jesus to dip and give it to someone, again, he had to be seated next to them. John's on Jesus' right. That means Judas is on Jesus' left in the position of guest of honor, which is a staggering thing to consider. Go ahead and write that down. Judas was seated on the left of Jesus in the position of the guest of honor. Even then, 
Judas could have repented. Even then, he could have changed his mind. Even then, he could have asked for forgiveness. Even at the Last Supper, Jesus is serving Judas. He's washing his feet. He's placing him in the position of guest of honor at his final meal before his death with his closest friends. There's there's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like him. There's nobody who's gracious like Jesus is. Verse 27, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, entered Judas. Judas reached the point of, of no return. You see, he had ignored the teachings of Jesus for so long. He had rejected Jesus as Messiah. And I think more than an an amount of time, there's no magic amount of time where you reach the point of no return. I would suggest to you it's related to how much revelation you received. And the reason Judas reached the point of no return is he had had three years of being with Jesus almost every day. Jesus in the flesh, seeing the miracles, hearing the teachings, being in his presence. You can't get more revelation from God than that. You can't. And if that's not enough, after three years of that, you're never going to turn to him. You're never going to turn to him. And Judas reached that point of no return. And Satan himself fully possessed Judas, which is a very unusual thing, even in Scripture. And that fact in and of itself tells us that Judas was not and had never been saved. He had never belonged to Jesus. He had never been a believer. Because while believers can be oppressed by satanic forces, they can try and attack us from the outside, no believer can have their spirit possessed by satanic forces. Because there's a sign in your soul, in your spirit, when you belong to Jesus, that says property of Jesus, no trespassing. Satan cannot possess any believer. Now, why does Judas agree to betray Jesus? Why does he do it? My personal belief now is that Judas had been completely consumed by covetousness, by desiring, lusting after things. He had a lust for power and and prestige and, and wealth. And I believe that he hung around Jesus because Judas believed that Jesus was going to be his ticket to all of those things. In other words, he believed Jesus was going to rise to political power, overthrow the Romans, establish a new kingdom, and then enrich those who had been closest to him. And Judas's plan was, I'm going to make sure I'm one of those beneficiaries. So when Jesus is top dog on the planet, I'm going to reap all the benefits You know, it was only a short time earlier that Jesus had been anointed at Bethany. You remember that incident where a woman pours out this incredibly expensive perfume on Jesus. The Bible says as an anointing for his death, as an act of worship. And in John 12, we read of Judas' response to Jesus receiving this extravagant worship. I'm not sure if it's on your outlines or not, but I'll read it to you. It says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Why didn't you sell it? It's worth so much money. That would have been better. Sell it. Don't pour it out on Jesus. And then we're told this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because, and then underline this, he was a thief and had the money box. And and then underline this, He used to take what was put in it. Judas was the only disciple from Judea. The rest of the disciples were from northern Israel in Galilee. Judea was the academic region of Israel. Galilee was the redneck part of Israel. And so Judas was made treasurer of Jesus' ministry. He was in charge of the money. When people gave money to Jesus, Judas took care of it. And this passage of scripture we just read tells us that Judas was skimming off the top. He was stealing from Jesus, literally, throughout the entire ministry of Jesus. Through all the teachings, all the miracles, all the conversations, Judas chose to reject Jesus and instead steal from him. Try to enrich himself by stealing from Jesus. Now if you follow the chronology, the order of events in the life of Jesus, you'll notice that there's only one week between Jesus' triumphal entry, the the event we know as Palm Sunday, and Jesus' crucifixion. And at some point in that week, 
is the moment where Judas goes to the religious leaders and says, let's make a deal. I'll hand him over to you. I'll betray him to you so that you can arrest him. And as I was thinking about it this week, I, I believe that Palm Sunday was the final straw for Judas. Because Jesus presents himself as king. He rides into Jerusalem on the donkey and they're all saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. But when all of that is over, Jesus cries over Jerusalem over the fact that they're not actually receiving him as king. They're rejecting him. And so Judas, at the beginning of that day, must have been, this is great. Jesus is going to present himself as king. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Good times are here. And then when that day is over, he must have been left thinking, that's it. You're not going to overthrow the Romans. There's no new kingdom coming now. There's not power and prestige and great wealth coming my way. And I think as he chewed on those realities, he became bitter and, and angry and disillusioned, upset. Because in his mind, he had wasted the last three years of his life following a king who seemed to have no kingdom. And in his anger... He came to hate Jesus and agreed to betray Jesus. Then we read this. Then Jesus said to him, said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. A literal translation of the original Greek reads it as what you've already decided to do, do it quickly. Verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. Again, that, that's why it's my belief that only John knew that Judas was the betrayer. Because if Jesus said to everyone, it's the one that I give the bread to, and then he gives it to Judas, I don't think they all go, huh? I think it would be pretty obvious. I think uh, John is referring to everyone else when he says no one at the table because he's the writer of this gospel. Jesus tells Judas to do what he has already decided to do for a couple of reasons. Number one, it proved that Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. And it proved that Jesus was the one in control of the timeline of events. Judas had planned to alert the religious leaders at what he deemed to be an opportune time. Judas was gonna choose the moment when he went and got the religious leaders. But Jesus said, no, you'll go do it now. It showed that Jesus was in control. He wasn't being outsmarted or taken by some unforeseen betrayal. He knew it all, he was in control of it all. Secondly, if word did get around from John to all the other disciples that Judas was the betrayer, Peter would have killed him before he could have ever left the upper room, and it would have been over very, very quickly. Verse 29, for some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So the disciples, they don't know what it means when he tells Judas to go do what he's already decided to do. They just assume that Jesus is sending him on some type of errand. Verse 30, having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately. Now when I was reading this, I was struck that the Holy Spirit is being repetitive. And let's see if we all notice this. Every time the Holy Spirit is redundant, or repetitive, it's always for a specific reason because he really wants us to notice something. And you'll notice that both in verse 27 and in verse 30, we're told that Judas left after eating the bread. Well, why is that important? Why do we need to know that he left after eating the bread? Why is the bread a big deal? Here's my theory. Because what had Jesus done just a little while earlier at the same dinner? He had served his disciples communion using the bread and the wine that was at their meal. And in Matthew's gospel, we read, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So th this bread that they continue to eat, most likely even from the same loaf that Jesus served communion to them with, first communion in New Testament history, just earlier that evening. Jesus had just told the disciples, including Judas, that his body would be broken for them and for the whole world. I'm going to die for you guys. So when Judas took the bread that Jesus passed him and he ate it, it was more than a sign for John that Judas was going to betray him. It was a symbolic gesture of Judas saying, I know you're going to die for me. I'm, I'm not ignorant. I know you're going to die for me. I know you're going to give up your body for me on the cross but you are not the savior I'm looking for. 
And it's reminding us that with full awareness of the gospel, with full awareness of what Jesus was going to do for him, Judas still went out and betrayed him. This heavy, heavy stuff. In Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus said out loud, this is on your outline, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And in Mark's gospel, it adds that Jesus said, it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. That's one of the single most serious statements that Jesus makes in all of the gospels about the eternal consequences of rejecting him. If you want to say, oh, no, no, if you reject Jesus, you'll get a second chance in the next life in purgatory. There's no hell. It's not real. Whatever is happening to Judas for rejecting Jesus is so bad that Jesus himself says it would have been better if he had never been born. It would have been better for him. And then verse 30 ends with this statement, and it was night. And indeed it was, not just literally but spiritually, the darkest night the world has ever known. Verse 31, so when he, Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. These two verses are a sermon in and of themselves. You're thinking, Jeff, I don't have that long, but I'm going to keep it quick. Jesus says, now the Son of Man is glorified. And most of us know what's about to unfold over the next hours and days. At the end of these next few days, Jesus will be alive, the first man resurrected from the dead by conquering death itself. He'll be glorified, he'll be exalted, he'll be victorious. He will have secured salvation for all who desire to join the family of God. We know all that is coming up, but yet Jesus lumps all the other stuff that's about to happen into the same category as all that great stuff. And he says, all of it is a part of him being glorified. In the hour when he's betrayed, the hour when he's gonna be falsely accused, beaten, tortured to within an inch of his life, the hour in which he will be nailed to a cross and left to die, in that hour, the Son of Man is glorified. Not when he calmed the raging sea, not when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Not when he walked on water. Not when he stupefied the supposedly enlightened religious leaders of the day with his brilliance. Not in any of those times. But in the hour of his greatest suffering, Jesus was glorified by the Father and glorified in the Father. That's just, this just wrecks me because I still believe that I'm being glorified by God and I'm most in his will when everything's going well in my life, when, when it's easy, when it's all working out. But the example of Jesus tells me that I'm really being most glorified by God when I choose to be faithful and obedient to him in very difficult circumstances. That's what Jesus did. Write this down. We are most glorified by God when we choose to be faithful and obedient to him in very difficult circumstances when we choose to be faithful and obedient to him in very difficult circumstances. Now please hear me. It's not that God glorifies you just because you're suffering. It's that God glorifies you when you're suffering as a result of being obedient to him. If you're suffering because you made stupid decisions, God's not like, that's great, let's, let's glorify you. He's just like, maybe don't do that next time. That's your lesson this time. But if you're suffering because you're continuing to obey God and be faithful to Jesus, even when it's very hard to do so, you're being glorified by the Father. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean your eternal rewards, the things that await you in the presence of Jesus are becoming more glorious. And when you get there and ask why you're receiving these rewards, it's going to have a lot to do with those times when you were faithful and obedient to the Lord, even when it was difficult to do so. When Jesus says, I'm being glorified by the Father, the, the glory that was awaiting him in the presence of the Father was increasing as he continued to be faithful and obedient to the Father while he was here on the earth. Many times we look on and we say, this was Jesus' most tragic hour. But even as he was approaching it, Jesus himself wasn't saying that. Jesus was saying, I'm now entering the hour of my greatest glory and my greatest victory. 
get it straight. The cross was a triumph, not a tragedy. Verse 33, Jesus says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, the Jewish religious leaders, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, he's just saying, boys, I'm going somewhere. I'm going on a journey that you can't go on right now. Verse 34, a new, underline new commandment I give to you. That you, and then I have the rest of this underlined in my Bibles. That you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you were my disciples if you have love for one another. He gives his disciples a simple command, love one another. Have you noticed in life, though, that simple rarely means easy? You'll spend the rest of your life trying to actually live this out. But please notice that in this instance, Jesus isn't saying love everybody. He's saying love one another. The one another that he's speaking to, the only one another's in the room right then are disciples, believers, followers of Jesus. How do I know Jesus is speaking only to them? Because Jesus distinguishes his followers from non-believers by calling his followers one another and calling non-believers all. He puts them in two groups. Let's read the verse again and you'll see it. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The idea is that non-believers, those outside the church, would look at the church, those who follow Jesus, and see a love between those in the church that is so radical, it is the defining characteristic of those who love Jesus. Those who don't believe in Jesus should be able to look at the church, and when I say the church, I mean those who love Jesus, and marvel at this group of people who are made up of different ages, different races, different wealth levels, have different interests, but yet love each other like family because through Jesus they are family. Why would you give money to help Christians you've, you've never even met? Why would you spend time and energy to, to pray for someone who's nothing like you, who's not even your friend? Why would you care to try and help someone who could never pay you back? Jesus said the church is supposed to look different to the rest of the world. And here's how you're going to look different. In my church, you're going to love one another. It's an incredible command. And it means that in each of our lives, there should be things that we are doing for the church, the people of God, solely because we love one another. If you're only doing things for and with the people of God that serve your interests and needs, if you're only praying for people in the church that you like, only talking to people in the church that you like, only serving people in the church that are like you, then you might need to ask yourself if you're truly loving the one another of the church. Who are you praying for? Who are you serving? Who are you talking with just to make sure they have someone to talk with? If we can't get love right in the church, we're definitely not going to get it right out there in the world. The defining characteristic of every believer should be love. That's what Jesus wants in and from his church. So make a note of this. Jesus desires love among believers to be the defining characteristic of his church. He desires love among believers to be the defining characteristic of his church. But hang on a minute, because Jesus said a, a new commandment. And this is not a new commandment. All the way back in Leviticus, in the law, several hundred, hundred years earlier, the law had said that every person was to love your neighbor as yourself. So what's new about this command that Jesus is giving? Well, you know, pretty much everyone, Christian or not, agrees that it's good to love others. I've never really heard a counterpoint to that from anyone when I've shared it with them. I disagree. Here's why. The problem our world has is in defining what love is. Everyone wants to define it on their own terms. And it turns out that for most people, defining love ends up being something very inconvenient to them. It basically means they get to do what they want and decide what love is. So after letting people try for hundreds and hundreds of years to define for themselves what love is, 
and experience utter failure at doing that. So from the time the law was given in Leviticus, God had said, love your neighbor as yourself. Go love. And they spent hundreds and hundreds of years trying to live up to that, failing miserably. After all that, here's what's different. Jesus came to the earth as a man and through his life and death, he actually defined what love is practically. He showed what it looks like. He put flesh and bones on love. What was new was Jesus saying, love one another as I have loved you. That was the new part. Not love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love one another as I have loved you, according to my example. And instead of asking us to do that on our own strength, which is what the law did, Jesus would give us, the church, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the actual power to love people the way that he calls us to. So make a note of this. The new command to love one another came with a new example, that was Jesus, and new power, the Holy Spirit. It came with a new example and it came with new power. Jesus gave a new example and the Holy Spirit gave us the power to follow that example. As we talked about last week, if you just try to love people and serve people in your own strength, you're not going to go very long or very far before you get bitter and resentful that you're not being properly appreciated for serving them. The only way you can actually live as a servant is to have the Holy Spirit empower you and to ask the Lord to help you to do that. In today's Western church, we're generally getting this verse so, so backwards. Because many believers think that the defining characteristic of the church is that we're supposed to love the world. We're supposed to love non-believers. For some reason, they read this and they think, oh, Jesus wants his church to be defined by the way we love people who don't believe in Jesus. And so when non-believers say, you're being unloving, Because you're saying what I'm doing in my life is sin. Many believers will go, oh my goodness. They're saying we're unloving. We're we're failing the commandment of Jesus. What do we need to do to make them feel like we love them? Change our beliefs? Okay. It's our love for one another among believers that's supposed to be the distinguishing mark of Christians. Here's how it's meant to work. You love the Lord first. You love the people of the Lord's church. And then you love everyone else too. But never at the expense of loving the Lord first and loving the people of the Lord's church. If you have to compromise loving the Lord, doing what he wants, if you have to compromise loving his people in order to love people who don't believe in Jesus, you can't do it. You got to love the Lord first then you've got to give priority to the people of God. The Apostle Paul tells us to do that as well. He says, as much as we have opportunity, do good to all, but especially to those of the household of the faith. We've talked about this before, that it's disgraceful that a Christian would help a non-believer who's starving if there's a believer who's starving somewhere. Because it's like neglecting your family to take care of someone that you don't even have any type of relationship with. You take care of family first. That's what Jesus wants us to do. So we do our best to love non-believers, but they're not always going to love us or what we believe. And so they're not always going to feel loved by the church. That's just the reality of the situation. The last thing I'm going to say about this verse, don't get too excited, is this. I think we've all heard some version of this Gandhi quote. For a second there, I was going to do it in his accent, and I'm like, no, that's a terrible idea. I'm going to offend somebody else. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me. That was what that Paul's about. He's like, don't do it, Jeff. That's a terrible idea. (laughs) Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And when I say you've heard that quote before, maybe you've heard this version of it. You know, I left the church because it was so full of hypocrites or I go to church sometimes, but I just can't stand the people. Or, you know, I'm into Jesus and the things that Jesus taught. I'm I'm just not into the church. Too messed up and judgy. Here's the thing. Jesus is crazy about his church. He loves his church. He died for his church, knowing all the jacked up issues his church would have. 
And Jesus said to his disciples, here's what I want you to do. Love my church. Love my church. Look at your Bible. There's no asterisk after that. It doesn't say at the bottom of the page that Jesus added, unless they're hypocrites, unless they're really backwards, unless the music is terrible, unless the seating isn't comfortable, unless there's no AC in the building. That doesn't say that. It just says love one another. Love one another. And in the next chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is going to tell his disciples this. Real simple. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. You want to know what you can do for me, Jesus says? Do what I've asked you to do. Love my church. The person who doesn't love the church does not have the heart of Jesus, and they don't love Jesus. The world says, oh, I can love Jesus but not love the church. Jesus says, no, you can't. No, you can't. You can't love Jesus and not love the church any more than you can love me and not love my wife. I'm going to tell you that's not an option. You don't love me and my wife? We got no relationship. We're a package deal. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you love Jesus, then you love his church. That's the only option he gave us. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. You're going to follow me there later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. In other words, before it's morning, Peter, in the next 12 hours, you're going to deny even knowing me, not once, three times. Now before we get into this, there are some additional details around this interaction in Luke's gospel. So I think it would be worth turning there together. It's just going to be the gospel before the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So just go back one gospel. Go to Luke 22, verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And we pick up the same interaction in verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord, that's Jesus, said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked, underline asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. There are parallels here that are impossible to miss to the first chapter of the book of Job in the Old Testament. And I encourage you to take some time this week, just go read that first chapter of the book of Job and compare it to this verse in Luke. So Satan comes before God and asks, asks permission to put Peter through some difficulties, some trials, which tells us that when the people and the little girl come to Peter in the next few hours and say, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? This is telling us that Satan is the one who sends them to Peter. He's the one who arranges for Peter to be put in the situation where Peter will deny Jesus. It seems that Satan is coming before Jesus in a venue. If you were with us for our study in the book of Daniel, I don't have time to camp on this. But the idea is that there's some sort of divine counsel that we talked about in our Daniel study. And it's the same divine counsel that appears in Job chapter 1, and Satan is coming before the Lord in this divine council and asking for permission to put Peter through the ringer. We know from Scripture that Satan rules the earth right now. How do we know that? Well, because when Jesus is tempted at the beginning of his ministry for 40 days in the wilderness by Satan himself, Satan offers Jesus the kingdoms of the world if Jesus will bow down to him. And Jesus doesn't say, Satan, what are you talking about? You don't own the kingdoms of the world. Jesus never disputes Satan's ownership of the kingdoms of the world. But we also learned in the book of Daniel when we studied that, that while Satan rules the earth right now, there are limits to his governance. He has to ask permission from the Lord in order to establish anybody as a political ruler on the earth. And here we learn that Satan is required to ask the Lord's permission before putting any believer through a trial, which means that while the trials we go through are not designed by God, they are allowed by God. And the Lord promises in his word that he has a plan to do good through any trial he allows us to go through. Those trials are either to purify or grow our faith 
or to allow our conduct, how we handle ourselves through that trial, to be a testimony and a witness and an encouragement to others. That brings glory to God. And while this doesn't make going through trials any easier, what it does for me is it reminds me that I'm never going through a trial or a period of suffering that God didn't see coming and that God is not aware of and that God doesn't have a plan to do something good through. That means there's purpose in my suffering. God's doing something. And my prayer for my life is that simply knowing that God knows what's going on and he knows why would be enough for me. That knowing what I know about God and how good he is, that I could just trust him. Lord, you know, and that's enough. That's enough. Verse 32, Jesus says to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren, strengthen your brothers. I love this. Peter, you're gonna go through an intense trial, but I've already been praying for you. Can you imagine Jesus himself saying, I've been praying for you? Hebrews 7.25 says he is. It's on your outlines. It says, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him. Jesus always lives to pray for you. He'll get you through it. When you and I are in a trial, he's praying for us, and he's been praying for us before the trial even started. I'm so thankful for that about our God. Now, did you catch this? Jesus says to Peter, and when you have returned to me, when you have returned to me, there's, that means two things. Firstly, it means Peter's going to leave Jesus. He has to, otherwise he wouldn't be able to return to Jesus. We're not talking about salvation here, but we are talking about him being a disciple. Peter, for a time, is going to cease to be a disciple of Jesus. That's how intense this trial, this sifting is going to be. Secondly, but catch the hope in the words of Jesus. He tells Peter, you're gonna go into this, but then he says, when you have returned to me. Jesus declares to Peter that he's going to end up back with Jesus. He's gonna make it out the other side of this trial. And Jesus even tells Peter the purpose of this trial, why God is allowing it. He says, and when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren strengthen, encourage your brothers. When Peter comes out the other side of this trial, the idea is that he's going to have the ability to encourage and strengthen the faith of his spiritual brothers and sisters in a whole new way. That's the purpose of this whole trial. That's why God's allowing it. At this point in his life, Peter believes he's a spiritual giant, most important disciple of them all. He believes that he's never gonna fail, he's never gonna stumble, he's never gonna shrink back in fear, he's never gonna give in to temptation. And our Lord is saying to Peter, I I can't use you in this condition. You're never going to understand my grace until you understand how much you need it yourself. You're never going to be able to lift others up until you realize how much you yourself stumble. The gospel is not going to be true good news to you until you see yourself as a sinner as much as you see everybody else as sinners. So Peter, I'm allowing this trial in your life because it's what you need right now. You need to change and this is the only way it can happen. There's a reason people say that your mess today can be your ministry tomorrow. I think we all understand that it's a whole nother level of ministry when someone sits down with you and encourages you and they've actually been through something similar to what you're going through. And they're speaking from experience. That's a whole nother level. It was A.W. Tozer who profoundly observed that whom God would use greatly, he will hurt deeply. If you study the lives of the great men and women in the Bible, I promise, For for all of them, you will inevitably find some incredible, incredible trials in their life. We read about these people in the scriptures and we go, oh, I wish I could be like them. Go, Go read about their life. Discover what they actually went through. You might change your mind and be like, no, I'm good. I'm good with who I am, Lord. God bless them for their calling. But you know that's never changed. If you look at the world today, And you begin to look at the men and women that God is using in a profound way to minister to people around the world today. Dig into their lives. You will find the same thing. You will find incredible trials, incredible loss, incredible suffering they've gone through. 
each of them, so that they could become usable by God in a whole new way. There's a lot of people I've looked at and thought, man, I'd love to have their ministry. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then I find out their story, and it's like, man, God bless you, brother. I'm so happy for you, Lord. I'm good right here. This, you can keep me right here. I'm good. And Peter was no different. He needed to be changed in a way that only trial by fire could induce. Verse 33, but he, Peter, said to him, Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Jesus doesn't say this to Peter to put him in his place or to come down on him or to condemn him or to say, Peter, here's the thing. You suck, and it's not going to work out. I know you have good intentions, but you're really awful, and you're going to run away in the moment when I most need you. Jesus says this to Peter to give him hope. Now, what do I mean by that? In the moment when Peter would deny Jesus for the third time and realize suddenly what he had done, can you imagine the overwhelming guilt and shame that would have come over him like a tidal wave. Jesus wanted Peter to be able to think back and realize that Jesus had known all along that Peter was going to do that. And yet Jesus had still told Peter that he would build his church upon him. He had still told Peter that he loved him. It's the same incredible truth that Jesus has shared with you and I to every single one of us he said, hey, before you were even born, I knew every sin that you were going to commit. I knew all the moments of weakness and failure and compromise and fear that you would have. I knew all the promises that you would break, all the commitments to me that you wouldn't be able to follow through on. And knowing all that, I loved you. I died for you and I prepared a future for you. And I'm still walking with you. One of the things in life that will make you just love the Lord is when you really, really screw up and you realize that despite what you just did, not one of the promises of God has changed. And he spoke those things to you with full awareness of what you've just done. Something that shocked you, you're stunned by your own sinfulness. And you realize that God, God knew about it before you were even born. And he still said everything to you that he says in his word. He still said, I love you. Still said, I've come to die for you. So make a note of this. Jesus loved and called Peter and us with total foreknowledge of our future sins and failures. He had total foreknowledge of our future sins and failures. We'll keep reading in Luke 22. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And then Jesus quotes from Isaiah 53. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Here's what's going on. When Jesus had previously sent his disciples out to minister, some of you might remember earlier in his ministry, he, he has a bigger group of 70 disciples and he sends them out in pairs to go and preach the gospel. And, and he sends them out with nothing because he wants to build their faith. And they go into towns and God has supernaturally arranged for there to be people to take them into their homes to host them, people to give them money, people to feed them, people for them to minister to. And what Jesus is saying is he's saying, guys, that, that's the way it was before. But guys, guys, things are changing. From here on out, you're gonna need to use a more normal approach when you go out to minister. You're going to need to raise funds for your trips. You're actually going to need to plan. You're going to need to take supplies. You're going to need to think through being safe. Now, I think part of the reason for that is because 
God desires to involve the people of his church in his work across the earth. He desires to use the church to financially support the gospel around the world and for us to go on trips and to to take supplies and to host people and all those things. But Jesus is also telling his disciples this because everything was about to change. Because for those three years that Jesus is on the earth ministering, up until the point of his death, Jesus is essentially invincible. If someone were to try and kill him, they wouldn't have been able to do it. It wasn't his time. If someone had tried to kill one of the 12 disciples or part of the group of 70, they wouldn't have been able to do it. It it wasn't the time yet. They were under the supernatural protection while Jesus was ministering. And Jesus is saying, listen guys, here's what's coming up. I'm going to be numbered with the transgressors. In other words, I'm going to be considered a criminal and the things concerning me have an end. This season, guys, is coming to an end. And he's letting them know, guys, I'm going to be killed and people are going to try and kill you now. And eventually they're going to succeed. Things things are changing. Now the sword that's being referenced here is for defensive purposes, not offensive purposes. The idea is, you know, if you guys are traveling from city to city, traveling some dangerous roads where there's bandits, he's like, you should take some protection with you. What's interesting to me is that this single verse completely destroys the idea that Christians are supposed to be pacifists. Jesus himself is telling his disciples, hey, if a bandit attacks you, You should defend yourself. If you're going out to teach the gospel, it would be great if you actually got there alive. Jesus doesn't say, listen guys, since that bandit obviously doesn't have a relationship with me, and if you kill him defending yourself, you'd be sending him to hell, you should just let him kill you. He doesn't say that. He says, take a sword with you. The idea is so that you can defend yourself. Now, because they're the disciples and they're not that bright, they miss the big point Jesus is making about how things are changing. And they just say, look, we've got a head start. We've got two swords right here. And Jesus is just like, that's enough of that. That's what he's saying. Let's move on. Let's do something else. So in everything we've read and studied today, I want to highlight the hearts of three of the disciples. And we're almost done. Hang with me. Judas, John, and Peter. Write this down and we'll unpack this. Judas has a rejecting heart. He has a rejecting heart. Now get this. For most of these three years, Judas is into Jesus. He's a fanboy. He's like, yes, this thing is going great. People are gathering around. We're building momentum, having a great time, laughing at the jokes like all the other disciples. But, but we know his secret, don't we? He's stealing from the Lord the whole time. Because what he was really after was power, position, prestige, and wealth. And as soon as he realized Jesus wasn't offering him that in this life, he didn't simply walk away from Jesus, he began to hate Jesus. And you might be thinking, well, there's not really a parallel to that today, but but I would disagree because here's what happens all the time. Someone expresses an interest in Jesus. They begin coming to church. They may even tell people, you know, I've given my life to Jesus. But then something happens. They suddenly hear something they don't like. They go to a small group study or they come to a service and the pastor teaches something from the Bible and they're like, oh, I don't like that. And they hear the pastor make it really clear that no, the the Bible means it. It says what it means and means what it says. And suddenly, suddenly they're like, I'm done. I'm done with Jesus. I've seen it happen. Maybe you have too. And it breaks the heart of Jesus as much as it broke his heart when Judas rejected his offer of salvation. And it makes no sense just as much as the actions of Judas make no sense. I really don't understand this. People hear the gospel and they seem to understand I'm broken in a way that only Jesus can heal. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness and Jesus is the only one who can give me that forgiveness. And they seem to understand I need to be saved from hell and Jesus is the only one who can do that. And then they walk away from all that when they find out that God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman. I'm done. I'm done. They walk away from all that when they find out that the Bible teaches sex is designed to take place inside of marriage. No, no, I'm done. They walk away from all that when they find out the Bible says we're supposed to put God first in our finances and tithe. Forget this. Judas' choice troubled Jesus and it broke his heart because it is staggering that anyone would say, I don't care about heaven or hell. I don't care where I'm going to spend eternity, who God is, what the meaning of life is. 
or how I can know God. I don't care about any of that. If you're not a God who's offering me exactly what I want or doing things exactly the way I think they should be done, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. It's crazy, but it happens all the time. All the time. I've had someone come up to me after a service and be like, I felt the presence of God today in church. It was amazing. One quick question. What's your stance on gay marriage? And what blows my mind is that a person would actually say, essentially, I believe God has touched me. I found a way to connect with God but because God may have a different cultural value than I do, I'm prepared to completely abandon him. That's staggering. It's inexplicable, but it happens all the time. And all I'm going to say about that is this. If you don't believe that what Jesus is offering you is worth more than anything he could ask of you, then you do not understand what he's offering you. And you need to find out what it is so that you don't end up walking away from the Lord and having Jesus say of you, it would have been better for you if you'd never been born. And if you're considering walking away from Jesus because he's asking you to give up something that you don't want to give up, please don't. You have no idea how worth it Jesus is. He is so worth it. Keep seeking him until you understand that. Next, make a note of this. John has a resting heart. John has a resting heart. Jesus told John that Judas was going to betray him, and yet John doesn't get up from the table and try to stop Judas or talk Judas out of it. Why? We know John loved Jesus deeply. We know Jesus loved John because John tells us that. So, so why doesn't he try to stop Judas? Well, I suggest to you that John was probably the only disciple who actually understood that if Jesus said something was going to happen, it was going to happen. Not only that, but if Jesus said something was going to happen, then it meant Jesus either wanted it to happen or he was allowing it to happen. And John realized that if, if he tried to stop Judas, he would actually be working against the will and word of Jesus. And so John stayed at the table next to Jesus, resting. Do you remember when Jesus was with the disciples in their boat on the Sea of Galilee and this giant storm comes up? They all think they're going to drown. They're all freaking out. Do you remember what Jesus is doing? He's sleeping. He's sleeping in the boat. And, and the lesson there was that Jesus is always our example. So, so whatever Jesus is doing, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So what should the disciples have done at that moment in the boat? Guess it's nap time. Lie down next to Jesus and everything would have been fine. John had learned that lesson. And so instead of getting up and, and freaking out, he stayed seated beside Jesus because Jesus wasn't getting up and freaking out. And when it seems like everything's gone to hell, Jesus is on the cross, it seems like darkness has won and the disciples have all scattered because they're thinking they've killed Jesus and where what's next? There's one disciple, only, only one who doesn't run. And it's John. And as Mary, the mother of Jesus, is at the foot of the cross, convulsing with tears at the sight of her disfigured son dying in front of her, John is standing next to her with his arm around her. And it's the disciple who simply rested in Jesus to whom Jesus gives the special task of caring for Mary, his mother. You know the scene, Jesus is on the cross and he says to them as they're there, John, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. And if you haven't figured it out yet, John has the heart that we want to have. It's the heart that understands Jesus is sovereignly in control of everything. It's the heart that understands that Jesus is going to do what Jesus wants to do. And nobody's going to stop him. It's the heart that understands every promise and every word Jesus has spoken is going to come true. And it's the heart that understands our job is just to stay beside Jesus and get on board with what he's doing. 
It's the heart that knows how to rest in Jesus. And then lastly, write this down. Peter has a resistant heart. He has a resistant heart. There came a time earlier in Jesus' ministry when he began to tell his disciples plainly that he was the Messiah, the, the Savior sent by the Father. And the Bible tells us that Jesus also began to explain to the disciples that, quote, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And then we're told how Peter responded. And I love this because it, it's so absurd. It's, it's just wonderful. This is how Peter responded. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. And I laugh every time I read that because it's so ridiculous. Are you getting this? Peter took Jesus aside to rebuke him. I sort of think that in heaven right now, every now and then, Jesus just brings it up. He's like, hey, Peter, remember that time you took me aside to have a word and put me in my place? Remember that? He just, gosh, would you let it go? And, and Peter forgot, you see, what the prophet Isaiah wrote when he said, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? The answer, Peter and most of us too. Or how about earlier this very same night, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples and when he comes to Peter, what does Peter say? You shall never wash my feet. Now listen to me. Peter loved the Lord. Peter believed Jesus was Messiah, the Son of God. And Peter was brave. We know that later that same night when several hundred men come to arrest Jesus, Peter, against every shred of common sense, he, he whips out his mini sword and he starts swinging and all he hits is some guy's ear but still, he's brave, he's dumb, but he's incredibly brave. Peter was the only disciple who walked on water. And I say all that to remind us that Peter's faith was sincere. He's a true believer. And yet at this point in his life, his life is characterized by a resistance to the plans of the Lord. My goodness, how easy it is for us to be guilty of the same thing. The Lord speaks clearly through his word and he says, this is what I'm doing. This is how I want you to do things in this area of your life. And we respond with no, that's not what we're doing. You don't know what you're talking about, Lord. Clearly, my way is the better way of doing things, Lord. Let me pull you aside and rebuke you. Be it in the areas of money or marriage, relationships, parenting, dealing with conflict, work, sex, whatever area of life it may be, the resistant heart says, I know what you've said, Lord, but that's not the best way. I've got a better way. I've got a better idea, and that's what I'm going to do. It's not a rejection of Jesus. It's a resistance to his plans for your life. And let me tell you what you can learn from Peter, or you can learn the hard way through your own experiences, as I have. You will always end up feeling like a fool for resisting God and not getting on board with his plan sooner. There will never be a time when you look back and say, you know that time where I ignored what the word said and did things my way? That was really the turning point when everything started going great for me. You will never have that moment. I guarantee it. When Peter tried to rebuke Jesus, for telling them that he was going to die, Jesus responded by saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Translation, Peter, right now you're functioning as a messenger of Satan. You think Peter felt foolish for simply not getting on board with the Lord's plan? I, I think so. Don't make that mistake. And if you're making that mistake, then stop. Repent, change course, get on board with the Lord's plan. If you know today that you're having a resistant heart toward the Lord in any area of your life, change today. Change today. And here's the great news about the resistant heart. It can change. And Peter did change. He would end up leading the Jerusalem church. And Jesus really would build the early church through him. Peter told Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. We know that Peter would fail in the next 12 hours to even owning up to knowing Jesus three times. But Peter would go on to both prison and to death for Jesus. If you're resisting the Lord, then change. 
The disciple with the resting heart was the one who was closest to Jesus. And that's how you get a resting heart. You stay close to Jesus. The closer you get to him, the better you know him and the easier it becomes to trust him. Even when things don't seem to make sense. Next to Jesus is the only place of true rest. When Jesus is saying, just rest in me, you're not going to find rest by getting up, running around the room, freaking out, waving a sword around, trying to kill whatever is attacking you. Next to Jesus is the only place of true rest. And if you're restless today, you don't need to be praying, Lord, give me a solution to my problem. Your first thing is you just need to get next to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, just help me to slow down and be still and be with you. Just rest in him. With that, would you bow your head and close your eyes? And Father, we pray that if any among us have a resistant heart to you in any area of our lives, Lord, would you shine a light on it by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you just illuminate it in our spirits, Lord, so that we can change, so that we can repent, so that we can set a new course, Lord? We understand that your plans never fail, but your plans are also always what is best. Lord, we know that if Peter had had his way, you never would have gone to the cross and won salvation and heaven for us. But Lord, we know that we could also miss out on some great things in this life by resisting your will. And so Lord, if there's any area where we need to change, we invite you to show it to us so that we can change. Father, help us to be great at loving one another. And Lord, we confess we can't do that without the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I know we all long for more of those moments where we just hear you speak to us, instructing us to to speak to a person, to pray for a person. So Lord, for for those of us who maybe it's been a long time since we've heard you speak to us that way, would, would you just open our ears again to hear you in those moments? We want to be used by you, Lord God. Increase our spiritual sensitivity. And Father, help us to rest in your son, Jesus. Even though the hour may seem dark, even though the situation may seem dire, help us to look to you and realize that you're not panicking. You're not freaking out. You're over all things. May we always represent your greatness by having a calm confidence in who you are. Not a panicked state that shows we're not sure if you can handle this situation in our lives. But a peace that comes from knowing you are God. You are praying for us. And you are moving on our behalf, Jesus. Help us to rest in you, Lord. I pray if there is anyone in this room who is anxious, anyone who is fearful, that in the name of Jesus, your perfect love would cast out all fear. And we would rest in you. Lord, I, I, I just pray for those who have not been sleeping well because they have been anxious. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I just ask that they would rest even tonight in a way they haven't in a long time. Not because everything is suddenly better, but because they know they belong to you. And that your hand is on them. And you hold their life in your hands.